Good evening. Um, I'm Stephen Worlds, and I'm here as a representative of the Project for the Study of Liberal Democracy, the, which, uh, along with the generosity of the Jack Miller Center, is the principal uh, sponsor for tonight's lecture. I'm also a representative of the Political Science Department and the Political Economy Program, which are also sponsors, and I'm happy to uh, acknowledge the support of the Department of Academic Affairs. It is uh, Constitution Day, uh, the day that the Constitutional Plan was signed. Uh, I would prefer June 21st to be Constitution Day, because that was the day that plan was actually ratified uh, by the ninth state, which I believe was New Hampshire. Uh, but we'll, we'll stick with this one. Um, uh, we should, I think, celebrate uh, a constitution of freedom like ours. We should celebrate it freely. The, the great irony is uh, that we, at Rhodes College, a private institution, are required by the government uh, to recognize this day. I think that's just one of the ironies. Um, in fact, <laughs> that fact is that very fact, and the origin of that fact is filled with other ironies. And that is that um, uh, a senator from West Virginia, uh, Senator Robert Burr, may he rest in peace, supposedly a big fan of the Constitution, when he came up with this idea of developing a Constitution Day and requiring it. Uh, all institutions that receive federal funding must um, uh, acknowledge it and, and, and celebrate it in some way. He couldn't get that bill out of his committee. They wouldn't pass it. So he, being a master of parliamentary procedure, stuck it into a huge omnibus spending bill, which then, in other words, and then that passed Congress, which in other words, Constitution Day, became the law of the land with almost no one noticing it, which I think is. <laughs> and, I, and I think if you ask, you know, Senator Byrd, do you really think this is the, the framers thought that this is how the legislative process would work? I think you'd have trouble with that. Uh, <laughs> now, the other irony is, arises when you think about, if you ask yourself, where does the national government get the authority to require a private institution to <laughs> celebrate this? And the short answer to that is the general welfare clause. Now, I'm not going to go through all the complications with that, but if you look at the general welfare clause, you will see that Senator Byrd had to ring those, you know, had to twist those words really hard to ring out of them the authority to mandate this, which is a little strange for someone who really admires the Constitution, but we'll let that go. Enough of the ironies. Uh, the General Welfare Clause is in Article 1, Section 8, which is the list of the powers of Congress, which is, in other words, the list of the powers of the national government. And cleverly, that brings us to the topic of tonight's lecture. Um, now, the Article 1, Section 8 is rarely, you know, in the last 50 years, has not been a hot topic. Uh, but recently it has, because it was the center of the fight the legal fight over the Affordable Care Act and the, what was called the individual mandate. Did Congress have the authority to mandate these things? Uh, but the Individual Care Act, cleverly once again, brings us to our lecturer for tonight. Uh, uh, for many years, uh, James Capretta has been working in the trenches. Uh, he worked in the trenches of policy, public federal policy. He worked for the OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, he then worked for the Senate Budget Committee, and you can, the numbers are starting to pile up, right? The calculators and numbers. He then worked for the House Ways and Means Committee, back to the OMB, and according to him, that last stint of the OMB just about killed him. So he got out of that, you know, out of the business of government itself, and now he is a fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. He is also a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. He has other affiliations. Um, he, his writing and research focuses on healthcare, healthcare policy, entitlement policy generally, fiscal policy most broadly. Um, he has a book on the alternatives to the, uh, you know, other alternatives to the Affordable Care Act. 
Uh, he's written many, many articles and papers, published by places as diverse as Brookings Institute on the one hand and Heritage Foundation on the other. Widely published in, in journals of policy and, and politics. And I encourage you to find this stuff and read it. Um, because one thing that strikes me without even considering what he's writing about is how engaging and clear it is. But then when you consider that he's writing about areas that are so complicated, so technical, sometimes very arcane, healthcare policy, fiscal policy, budget matters, then the clarity and engaging qualities of his writing are astounding. Uh, but he has agreed to broaden his focus tonight from these, these policy questions to their origin in the Constitution and the idea of limited government. So please welcome James Capretta. Well, thank you very much. That was an uh, overly generous introduction, but uh, I'll let you guys be the judge of that after I'm done. But uh, I'll admit, first of all, just to get started, that uh, I too am one of those many millions and millions of Americans who weren't aware that today was Constitution Day until I was invited to come and speak on it uh, a few months ago. And uh, in fact, it uh, came up just last evening at my home. Uh, as usual, on Sunday, we go through a little bit of what's coming up kind of thing, and I reminded everyone around the table that I was leaving the following morning to come to, to Memphis, Tennessee to give a talk at uh, Rhodes College, and, um, and uh, they asked me what the subject was, and I said, well, tomorrow's Constitution Day, and a lot of blind stares around the table. So, you know, I think this thing is actually catching on now, and the fact that Senator Byrd mandated it is actually having an effect, at least on the Capretta household. We're now learning about it more than we had before. So. Anyway, uh, all of that aside, I'm really pleased to be down here. I've never been here before. It's a terrific place. And uh, many, many thanks to Dan uh, Cullen and Steve Worlds for inviting me to come and having me down here, and to Jackie Baker for actually making it happen and, and organizing my trip down here. So thank you very much for this generous invitation. Uh, it's an appropriate time to reflect on the state of our constitutional order because we've got a lot going on in this country that are fundamental questions. And uh, although today I'm going to talk a lot about some of the concerns I see out there on the horizon, and maybe not the too distant horizon, uh, I don't want you to take that for uh, a general sense of malaise about our constitutional order in general. Uh, I think probably like most of you, uh, I believe our founders were true geniuses in terms of how they set up our government. We looked at the broad scope of what it's put and set in motion. Uh, and it has no equal really in human history. So uh, I wouldn't trade it for anything else. I'm pretty sure most of you in this room probably wouldn't either. Uh, my concerns are really being expressed tonight in the sense of uh, I want it to be perfect. And uh, you know we don't have utopia here on Earth. Uh, so we're never going to be uh, perfect, but uh, we can raise questions about how our constitutional order is operating, I think, legitimately on this kind of a day, and to think through clearly and carefully what we might need to do in the future to come up with a slightly different course, if that's called for. Uh, one caveat uh, I want to begin with also is that I'm not a lawyer. Maybe that's a good thing. Uh, I'm certainly not a constitutional lawyer or a constitutional scholar, that's not really my calling card. As you heard from, from Steve, I've really been an analyst in governments and working on actual policy and public policy and, and its implementation. But having said that, I've been around uh, government and politics now for, uh, you can give my whole bio to tell you how long, you can give me dates, which was very nice of them, but it's been 25 years that I've been working in and around uh, American government and politics. And so my observations are really coming from that perspective. I was kind of a practitioner working in the trenches, as Steve said, and what does it mean for the future? Uh, now, obviously, the topic tonight is, is uh, how, how we are, as a country, are grappling, or perhaps stated more carefully, not grappling, with the very serious problem of entitlement spending growth and its implications for self-government. Uh, in June, as Steve indicated, we all witnessed 
a bit of a collision between this issue of the entitlement state and um, our constitutional order in the form of a Supreme Court case around the Affordable Care Act, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Supreme Court took up the case really on grounds that actually were not fundamental to the foundation of what I would call the entitlement state. Um, that is, the, the actual question at issue, there were really two questions at issue in that case. One was related to the Commerce Clause. That is, did the uh, Congress have the authority under the Commerce Clause of the Constitution to compel behavior in a certain marketplace? Did it allow the Congress to you know, require people to purchase health insurance? That was the most fundamental question at issue. And ironically, maybe you probably know this, but lots of Americans I don't think quite do know it, is the answer was no. The answer was not yes, actually, it was no. <laughs> it seemed like it was yes, based on what the reporting and some of the surrounding hoopla around it, but the answer actually turned out to be no. That the Congress actually didn't have the authority to use the Commerce Clause to compel behavior. The Supreme Court then also said that they had a taxing power to penalize people for not doing something, but it's not the same thing, uh, because the taxing authority has additional, a different constitutional uh, uh, authority, and it has its own limits. And so, you know, we'll see in the future how far the taxing authority can go in terms of uh, trying to regulate behavior in the United States. But I, I think the reason I bring this up is there's, there's also a second question, actually, that they brought up, which was, did they have the authority to compel coercion or did they have the authority to coerce and affect states to participate in the program and administer it? And the answer to that was also no. So there were actually two, on two grounds, the Supreme Court ruled that the law was, uh, in words that really weren't used afterwards, unconstitutional. Um, now, uh, but that doesn't actually get to the fundamental question we're grappling with tonight, which is that, well, set that aside, what about the rest of the entitlement structure the United States government currently runs. Remember, we have a very large structure, which I'll describe in a few moments. Um, what's the constitutional authority for that? It wasn't the Commerce Clause. Uh, it isn't the Commerce Clause. It's actually, as Steve hinted at in his remarks, it's the General Welfare Clause provision in our, uh, Article 1, Section 8. It describes all the different things that a Congress is allowed to pass laws around, the enumerated powers of the Congress. And that spending authority, essentially it says in the Constitution, hey, you can spend money to secure the common defense and to promote the general welfare. And then there's some other things that are under both of those categories. Uh, now, uh, over our history, that was considered to be a pretty limiting principle. Uh, so for the first 150 years of our country's history, the centralized government run by the federal government uh, was relatively small. We had uh, law enforcement and customs and we raised some revenue and we protected, uh, we had a national defense system um, and uh, a few other things that were created over the years. Uh, but the understanding of what general welfare meant was relatively restricted in a lot of court cases. But that all changed very rapidly uh, beginning in the 1930s. Uh, the courts started to rule the general welfare clause, in effect, meant whatever Congress said it meant. And so if Congress passed something, and, and this is where the state we are now in our country, if the Congress passes something and spends some money on something, which it does very, very frequently, it's de facto assumed that that's uh, allowable under the general, general welfare clause. Now, one could imagine that Addressing this question of the entitlement state and wealth and, and uh, the welfare state, one might come at it from the question of, hey, maybe we need to come at that question differently. Maybe that is the problem. Maybe the source of some of our problems today is an overly expansive understanding of that clause. Let's go back and revisit it 75 years later. But, you know, I guess after working in government for 25 years, I do have, uh, maybe this is why I'm not a I maybe mean, I wouldn't, wouldn't be welcome to Tea Party rallies or something, but uh, that uh, getting that particular genie back in that particular bottle looks to be a pretty daunting challenge. You know, the the idea that 
the general welfare clause was, is the basis for social security. That's where it really essentially started, this current understanding of the general welfare clause. And Medicare. And the idea that even if you have a relatively conservative approach to jurisprudence, that you're going to be able to get that particular understanding of the general welfare clause, you know, back to where it was in the 19th century, the early 20th century, and maybe undo some of the entitlement structure that's been built on top of it. I mean, I'm, I'm an ambitious person. I like to work on big projects. But that, even that one seems a little bit daunting, right? And you don't get too many conservative politicians even or conservative jurists saying that that's really what needs to happen. So maybe we are uh, stuck with something else. Um, interestingly, uh, this issue of the interpretation of the general welfare clause uh, was controversial even at the very beginning of the country. Alexander Hamilton and James Madison had different understandings, and they basically wrote it, of uh, what it meant, right? So, you know, maybe it's not a surprise that 225 years later, uh, we have some different understandings in the country, because the two authors didn't agree either. Uh, so Hamilton was more expansive in his understanding of what could be done, Madison, very much the enumerated powers kind of guy, said, hey, wait a second, you know, really, we really mean it when we say this is the only things you can do. Um, and so uh, it's probably not surprising, as I indicated, that that's still a contentious issue. Uh, Hamilton is one in a certain sense, but even he would be, I think, shocked and astounded by what the federal government is doing compared to what it was doing 150 uh, or at the founding of the country or for the first 150 years of the country. Now, um, I, I think then if we're not going to come at the question from the issue of relitigating some cases around what the general welfare, welfare clause can do or can allow, uh, what are we left with? I think we're left with a question of, well, does our constitutional order allow us to self-govern in a disciplined way? That may be the more fundamental question at this point. Uh, that it sets in motion our elective representative system through the House and the Senate and the presidency. We elect them. Is that functioning in such a way that we have confidence that it is attending to future needs, uh, having a certain level of discipline to it so we don't um, become profligate in our spending? Uh, because this has been a concern actually for a long time. We, Probably many of you here know and understand that this concept of representative government and democracy was frowned upon by some very smart people. Uh, the ancient Greeks, especially Plato, notably, kind of looked at the whole system and said, it'll never work, right? Um, essentially, these folks will end up voting themselves a lot of benefits indirectly, right? And He's a pretty smart guy, Plato. Um, he, of course, had other criticisms. He liked, he thought a lot of citizens were dimwits. Now, <laughs> paraphrasing, um, and uh, we're capable of self-governance. So I'm not sure we buy into all of that. But uh, the notion that a democracy is too attentive to the near term and not attentive to posterity in the long term, gee, it seems like a valid concern especially in this day and age. Um, so that's what we need to explore, um, and especially in view of the current situation and its reality. Um, now, uh, one particularly ironic aspect of this point uh, is that we have in front of us a real-life example of a uh, functioning democracy that seems to have lacked a lot of self-discipline, and um, uh, means now is facing a day of reckoning. And ironically, of course, it's in Greece. <laughs> that uh, the, the cradle of Western civilization. Uh, and, you know, every democracy uh, that goes down this road of voting itself a lot of benefits runs the risk of eventually ending up where Greece is, where Essentially, Greece at the moment cannot go into the public markets and borrow money. No one will lend it to them. That's a pretty dangerous place to be, especially if you're in a catastrophic event. 
Uh, I was just reading today that the United States has tended to need to go into the markets, foreign lenders as well as private citizens in the United States lending the government money. They had to go in, the United States has had to go into that kind of a market in a big way only a few times, except for recently, when there was essentially an existential threat to the survival of the country. Right? So we did it in World War II in a humongous way. We did it in the Civil War. And we did it to some extent in World War I. But we never had a situation quite like today where we're borrowing at huge rates and we're not really facing that kind of an existential threat. So we may be facing uh, a, new, uh, a new situation that requires new thinking. Now, there's an old joke that, uh, that uh, General Motors, uh, oh, between 1975 or so and 2005, was transformed. It used to be a car company in 1975. Uh, but then in 2005, it became a retirement and health benefits uh, provision firm that, is sent, that also on the side made some cars that they tried to sell. And there's a huge amount of truth to that, as on all jokes, that uh, General Motors, over the course of that period of time, had ample, ample evidence that the contracts that it signed in the 60s and 70s and into the 80s were unaffordable in terms of their union benefit programs. Uh, as the world was moving into a global marketplace for automobiles, as it was rapidly in the 60s and 70s, it was absolutely clear that those benefit provisions were going to bankrupt the country or the company eventually, and they were going to have to make some changes. But they never did. You know, that, that change was always too painful in the near term and a problem too diffuse in the long term to actually act on. So they never acted. And then when a crisis hit, um, they had no way out. Uh, and they still actually have no way out, except for putting a lot of costs onto the taxpayer. Our problem at the United States level, at the level of the entire country, is that actually all that different from General Motors. Essentially, our, our government at the federal level is evolving slowly but surely into a massive retirement and health benefits provision enterprise that also happens to also be running a standing army and a global navy and trying to do some thousands of other smaller things. Okay. Um, but if you look at the actual effort and money involved at the federal level, most of it is now tied up in federal entitlement spending and a lot of that is health and pensions. Let me give you some of the numbers. In 1940, uh, transfer payments to individuals in the United States government totaled $19.7 billion in constant 2005 money. So just to keep, so we can keep the numbers straight. And if you look, just use 2005 money. Uh, in those dollars, it was about $19.7 billion was spent in 1940 on things like entitlement benefits, transfers to individuals through the taxing power of the federal government. That's a small amount of money, even in those terms. And that was about 1.7% of the total economy or GDP. By 2010, 70 years later, um, transfer payments to individuals had risen to more than $2 trillion annually. Okay, So we were at under $20 billion in 1940 in terms of what the federal government did. And now we're over $2 trillion every year. That's a huge difference. That's just a reconstitution. That's a totally different government than it was in 1940. The government that people saw in 1940 would look nothing like the government they see today. Uh, the government in 1940 was defense. It was the constitutional order. It was defense, the provision of you know, customs, border control, some law enforcement, um, some minor other investments that were aimed at national needs, including uh, the beginnings of some bridge systems and highway systems that were federally funded, um, some other things that were being done at the federal level, mainly projects and infrastructure and so on. The New Deal was starting at that point, but it was in its infancy. But the government looked nothing like it does today, which is to tax uh, in order to transfer. 
Uh, now, uh, in some ways, our fiscal problems can be summed up by looking at just three of those tax and transfer programs, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Social Security enacted in 1935, Medicare and Medicaid in 1965. In 1972, the total cost of uh, these three programs was just 4.4% of GDP. Um, by 2011, that spending had risen to 10.3% of GDP. Uh, our total budget in both of those years was roughly 20% of GDP. So in rough terms, uh, back in 1972 and throughout the 70s, those programs were about one-fourth of the budget, or one-fifth of the budget. And by 2011, or 2011 it, they were about half of the budget. Okay? Um, that's a six percentage point rise, by the way, in a 30-year period, 40-year period. Uh, six percentage points of our total economy being devoted to just the three programs, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Six percentage points of our total economy is a huge amount of money. Okay? Uh, it basically is the equivalent of the entire size of the Defense Department. Uh, about, you know, $750 billion. Okay? So over the course of that 40-year period, we added to the government expenditure side another Defense Department and used it to spend on transfer payments, basically to the elderly and through health care. And uh, that uh, new system was financed somewhat with taxes, but a lot of it was financed with federal borrowing through, through for Medicaid and Medicare in particular. So uh, we've gone through a, a massive transformation even when you look at it just for those three programs. Now, looking out into the future, by 2040, using reasonable assumptions, uh, the Congressional Budget Office projects spending on just these three programs, plus the new spending on the health care law, which was added to this uh, program, uh, will reach about 17% of GDP. Okay, so today we're at, in rough terms, 10.5% of GDP. We're going to go to 17% of GDP in the next 30 years. Now, remember, over the next 30 years, we're going to have to go from 41 million people age 65 and older to 71 million by about 20 years from now. So we're going to have this huge run-up in the number of people that are on these programs from the aging of the population. That's going to drive a lot of numbers. Um, so we've got healthcare spending rising rapidly, we've got a lot more people on the programs, we've extended the benefit to a very, very large portion of the public at this point. You mix all that together and it's a recipe for a massive, massive spending program. Uh, so. Between 20, just to recap, between 1972 and 2011, we added a new Defense Department to the, to the budget, six percentage points of GDP uh, associated with these entitlement programs. We're going to do it again in the next 30 years. And there's no new revenue plan to pay for it at the moment. There's no way to finance it in the existing revenue structure. And keep in mind that at 17% of GDP, this is just three programs that are going to cost that much. 17% of GDP is essentially the total take of the, of the federal government in terms of revenue today. Right now we raise about 18.5% of GDP in total federal revenue. That's, that's the average in the post-war period going back about four decades. Okay? So we've been on average being able to extract out of the public about 18.5% of revenue, of GDP and revenue in terms of tax collection. We're headed toward a situation where 17% of GDP is going to be spent on just three programs. That would be 1.5% of GDP for an Army and a Navy and a Marine Corps and Customs and you know, the IRS and the FBI and National Institutes of Health, education, highways, right? It won't fit. You know, the bottom line is there's no possible way that would ever fit. National parks, you, know, you name it. Moreover, it's important to realize that when people talk about our fiscal problems today, uh, the squeezes were already underway. In other words, because these entitlement programs have already had a very large run-up, uh, the investments that people would like to make through some of these other programs is already being squeezed today. Things that might be thought of as investing in the future, um, environmental things included, uh, are being squeezed very dramatically because there's just not enough money when you've devoted so much of the budget to the tax and transfer system. 
Now, um, CDO has also done uh, estimates going out into the future of what it will mean in terms of the federal budget in its entirety and borrowing. Recall that we, uh, between 1789, when the Constitution was ratified, and uh, 2008, over that period of time, we borrowed roughly, in total, or the cumulative total borrowing in that period was $5.8 trillion. A lot of money. Uh, that constituted, at the end of 2008, about 40% of GDP. Since then, in 2009 through 2012, just that four-year period, we've now borrowed over $1 trillion annually, and we're essentially about to double the amount of borrowing in four years that we did in the first 230 years. So, you know, it's a huge run-up in spending um, and a huge run-up in debt in just a very short period of time. By the end of this year, we're going to have, instead of 40% of our total debt, 40% of GDP in total debt, it's going to be about 70% of GDP in debt at the end of this fiscal year, which is only uh, two weeks away, for those of you who keep track. Fiscal year 2012, you can ring in a new fiscal year on October 1. Um, so we've already had a huge debt explosion in the last four years. And the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, they're nonpartisan, they do numbers for both parties. Um, they expect that by 2022, about 10 years from now, if we keep on our current course with current policy, we'll hit about 90% of GDP in debt. Now, 90% is an important number because Many economists, there's some recent academic work in this area, show that countries that exceed 90%, it's sort of the point of no return for some of these countries. That, and what do they mean by that? They mean that getting it back under 90% becomes almost impossible because the debt service on the original 90 is so expensive, and the political pain to get it back under 90 is so extensive that they can never quite get there again. And at that point, you know, if you're above 90% of GDP, going back to the existential question I brought up earlier, um, you're borrowing a lot of money every year, pretty much, um, and very dependent on lenders, domestic and foreign, to finance your government. You lose autonomy by doing that. Uh, so this 90% threat is only 10 years away, very real for the United States. The second point is that uh, if you borrowed uh, if you're on that path of current policy, CBO estimates that by 25 years from now, we'll hit 200% of GDP in terms of debt. Twice the size of our economy and outstanding debt to foreign governments. Now, we'll never get to 200% of GDP because of uh, the famous aphorism from, uh, from uh, an economic <laughs> professor, Stein. I forget his first name. Uh, anyway, he had, he had the saying, I'm affiliated with the American Enterprise Institute, he was with the AI a long, long time ago, and he said something on the order of, you know, if something, if there's an unsustainable trend on, ongoing, it's going to stop. You know, unsustainable things do stop eventually. Um, as always, you know, so much, it sounds like Yogi Berra, basically, right? But um, uh, this one will stop. We'll never get to 200% of GDP because some catastrophic event will happen before we ever get there. You're not going to have uh, that much treasury debt flooding the world economy for that period of time without something happening. Um, so we won't get there, but the question is what would, what would meltdown look like and would it get to us to a better place or would it just lead to more, to more misery? Look at what's happening in Greece today. Look, I don't want to make it seem like we're like Greece. And Greece is a tiny country. They have a very, you know, in many ways, that they, they, they have a very non-diverse economy. We have a very diverse economy. The capital markets are shallow, ours are deep. Uh, we are not in, you know, they're not in the same economic kind of category as this country. However, however, even the United States uh, isn't too big to fail in a certain sense. That um, one can imagine 25, 30 years from now, where people look back on us as being the fourth or fifth or sixth largest economy behind China and India and maybe a couple of others. 
And at which point, the idea of us being in economic trouble doesn't seem so cataclysmic to the rest of the world, and maybe they let it happen. Uh, it might be in their interest to let it happen. So, uh, you know, we have to keep all of these things in mind uh, in terms of world leadership, global leadership. Another startling fact, of course, is that to demographics, uh, just an aside, you know, if you look at the demographics going out to 2050, of the top 20 countries in terms of population size out to 2050, there's only a couple with deep, long-standing institutional historical commitments to democratic capitalism and sort of Western values, basically. Um, the United States is the number one. So if we aren't going to be in a position of strength and leadership, the, the, the world's most populous countries will be dominating all the world forums. You know, the UN, global trade, security arrangements, etc. And, you know, not to be too blunt about it, but uh, they're just historically, their value systems have not grown up out of Western civilization. They've grown up out of Eastern civilizations and other other origins, and so that it's not always clear that our values would be shared by them. And so one has to think about these things when thinking about whether it's okay we can just keep borrowing money at a very accelerated rate. Now, I don't want you to get the impression that our problems are all tied up in just Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. So the gloom and doom is not isolated just to them. There's more doom and gloom. And Here's a quick rundown of, of some other programs you probably have heard of and how many people are actually on them. Farm programs uh, is an entitlement benefit in the United States, and they're about to reauthorize it and expand it. Here's a surprise. Uh, and they can get more people entitled to it. Um, farm programs, about 1.4 million people uh, receive farm support payments. That is, these are the farmers themselves, not people dependent on the food from the farms uh, to keep their farm growing. Are going. Uh, it's long and complicated history about that program. David, just let it be said that uh, that um, most economists believe that if we went to zero, we'd all still be eating quite well and we wouldn't have to worry about it. Uh, student loan recipients. We have about. I know this gets a little too close to home here. Uh, there's 11.5 million people in the United States receiving student loan debt. Um, there's a Pell Grant program, which is a direct grant program, not a loan. That's about 9 million people. Uh, Medicaid, this is the health insurance program for low-income people. Uh, that's 61 million people. Uh, going to 88 million by 2017. Half, in many states now, half, not one-fifth, not one-tenth, half of all births are financed by Medicaid. An amazing statistic. So childbirth has suddenly become something that has to be financed with an entitlement benefit financed under the general welfare clause of the United States. You think about that, doesn't that seem a little bit, we've been having babies for a long time. The federal government didn't have to pay for them until in the last 30 years. Something seems slightly amiss there. Um, Medicare, uh, 48 million people uh, on Medicare. Social Security retirement, 44 million people. Uh, Social Security disability, which is really a separate program, another 10 million people. It's important to note on Social Security disability, that's the fastest growing component of this major part of the entitlement structure. 40 years ago, when we had more dangerous occupations and more dangerous work, there were this one I didn't have a chance to look up. I think five million people about in 1975. I think the program has basically doubled in a 35 year period. Okay? So we've redefined in effect what constitutes permanent total disability, maybe in some ways in good ways. I'm not denying that there are some legitimate, humane, obviously compassionate reasons for a lot of these changes. But just the sheer number, and the difficulty of making judgment calls from a bureaucratic level about who should be entitled and who shouldn't. And once it becomes a, a rule in federal law, 
federal government, I can tell you, I've worked with the federal government a long time, it's not a very nimble organization. Uh, so it makes, a, it makes a rule, and then it gets applied willy-nilly across the entire country, um, regardless of whether it makes sense for everybody. And we've had a, essentially a wholesale re redefinition of what constitutes permanent disability in this country. And it's mainly been moving in the direction of more and more people with mental disabilities getting on the program. Um, and food stamps is at an all-time high. I've heard in the presidential campaign, there are now 45 million people on food stamps, which is a lot of people. Now, uh, I want also to, to note that there's lots of literature that would indicate that the problems with moving to such a massive tax and transfer system at the federal level uh, creates problems not just fiscally, but also in a sense culturally and in terms of the relationship of citizen and government. What do I mean by that? Well, let's, let's talk about a couple of examples. Uh, welfare, the welfare program for the first, um, between 1935 and 19, uh, excuse me, 1996, we had a essentially federal entitlement to cash welfare benefits for mothers with dependent children who didn't have fathers who were uh, present or were, you know, who had died, and therefore the mother was unable to support the children. This was started in 1935 for the most humane of reasons, basically. The culture at that time said lots of men had, you know, during the Depression, you know, they had died, they were unable to support their, their wives and their children. The federal government started a program to help those families stay intact and keep the kids fed and clothed and go to school. Um, obviously, the most humane of reasons. But as always in these kinds of things, it's had a complicated, unintended result interacting with cultural changes. When you get to the 1960s and then beyond, it already had started to become clear that instead of always just helping someone who had fallen into that condition, it actually had bred that condition under some circumstances. That is to say, the presence of the programs themselves had made it much more, uh, had made it much easier, in all bluntness, for irresponsible fatherhood, for people to father children and then not take care of them. Um, and it's contributed over a very long period of time. It is not the only reason. We have lots of complex societal and social things going on that lead in the same direction. But this has interacted undoubtedly in a very profound way toward more and more single parenthood. Uh, the breakdown of the two-parent family, and the, in some uh, ironic and you know, hard to explain ways, the federal government has become a substitute provision in some ways for a lot of families. This is not a good thing, okay? It, 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 it doesn't, it, you know, there's a whole library full of evidence that would indicate that this kind of thing leads to other social problems. We don't need to go into all of them this evening, but they are, complicated and very hard to resolve if you let them continue on this path. Now, welfare reform comes along in 1996. Lots of pain and agony around this debate. A lot of fire. A lot of strong feelings. The basic idea of the reform sounded very tough. Sounded, hey, we need to limit the benefit, and people that are on the benefit need to work or be on their way to work. Those are the two criteria. Shouldn't be a permanent way of life. Um, this sounded to a lot of people to the ear as being uncompassionate and harsh and so on. And there, you know, you go back and read the history of the 1996 debate, it was very interesting. I mean, there's a lot of heat. Senator Patrick Moynihan was a, Daniel Patrick Moynihan was famous, you know, very astute observer of the social scene, was dead set against this, saying it would lead to, you know, women and children dying on the streets, etc. Um, and many, People of conscience were very much opposed to this. The bottom line, though, is that they basically were wrong. I mean, sometimes there's some accountability that needs to be part of these public debates. I always, you know, my one little public service announcement tonight is, hey, they were wrong. You know, if you go back and read the record about what they predicted would happen, didn't happen. And what did happen? Well, it turned out that when you went to a limited benefit, block granted to the states, the states actually had 
for a long time, had a lot of people on the welfare system that probably didn't belong there and could go back to work. And almost overnight, when the federal government came in and said, you know what, we're going to change this and give you a fixed amount of money with time limits and work requirements, within five years, the number of people on welfare fell by more than half. And they never came back. They still haven't come back, even in this very deep recession. And what happened? Well, they basically, you had to change the incentives. The federal government had to change the incentives for the states and for the participants. And even the most strident critics of that law now say they don't want to go back to the pre-96 arrangements. So it's a little bit of an interesting lesson there. I mean, we haven't done a lot of entitlement reform, but that's one. And it turned out to have massively positive benefits for the citizens it was intended to help, despite all the heat and hue and cry to the contrary. Um, additionally, uh, we have, uh, through the Social Security program, which is a great program, I might see a few Social Security recipients out in the crowd. I'm not pointing any fingers. Um, everybody depends on Social Security to some extent. But there's no denying that, and lots of academic studies have shown this, that it's contributed to uh, a lot of early retirement. And not just at the federal level, the equivalent of it at the state and local level has contributed to a lot of early retirement. That uh, we have, uh, as we've gotten more, uh, thanks be to God, we can live longer and live healthier lives and more productive lives. The irony is that we've now essentially set aside for a, a good portion of our populace one-third of their lives uh, for leisure, which is un, unheard of in human history. You know, never been done before. Much of it at the, at the, at the, and through a public benefit of some sort. We're talking tonight about federal entitlement benefits, but state and local benefits are very much the same way. And you know, it just becomes an unsustainable equation if you have so much of the working age population getting benefits for that long period of time at taxpayer expense. You don't have to be cool, dark, budget calculator like me uh, to say, hey, there may be a problem here. Now, what is the, back to the, back to the beginning, what is the fundamental problem here? What are we, what are we really worried about? What, are we, what should we be thinking about? I think, and I put it to a little lunch get together again, the way I put it is, I think we have, a, we have a problem in our constitutional order, or what I would call, this is an official political science term, uh, short-term-itis. That's a joke. Um, we have, through our uh, elected leaders, extremely short time horizons, and they're getting shorter and shorter and shorter. We have House members that are elected every two years, uh, we have senators who used to not be directly elected, probably worth noting that, uh, who are now directly elected by the citizens of their states every six years, and the president, of course, every four years, and can serve for two terms. When one looks at that, uh, one would say that it's almost impossible to believe that the House members I mean, you know, I have some political scientists in this room. You don't have to be, if people operate on incentives, which we do economically and I think probably do politically, the incentive for a House member is not to worry too much about 2040. He's worried about 2012, he's worried about 2014. Okay, so maybe you're asking the impossible to say to that House member, hey, you know, let's think about posterity. He's out raising campaign funds, he's, uh, taking tough votes, the other side is making a vote on horrible things, and um, he or she uh, has a very short time horizon. I've seen that up close and personal. Uh, senators, okay, they get six years. Maybe they are our constitutional saviors, right? In fact, if you read the, the founders' writings, they are in certain sense supposed to be our, our constitutional saviors. Figures. They're the ones who cool things down and uh, have attention to you know, more profound matters. They're supposed to be debating things endlessly and uh, talk, talk, talk. They do that. Um, 
But it's not at all clear to me that even with six-year terms that they are attending to the long term as they would need to to fix and address some of these fundamental problems. So what are the solutions to short-term ICE? Do, do we just trust our current constitutional order to correct itself, or is there potentially something we should be thinking about to address maybe some of these fundamental questions? Now, there are a couple of ideas. Uh, I heard at lunch today someone brought up again to me the issue of term limits. I'm not going to cover that one so much tonight because I didn't give that one much thought. But that's potentially an item. You could say that uh, if you limited people to uh, 12 year tenures in Congress, maybe they would start to think, especially in that last few uh, terms, uh, about things that are beyond their uh, short term career horizon. Um, one other item, though, that is talked about quite a bit is a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution. What if we just said in the constitutional construct that the Congress could not spend in excess of revenue rates? Many states have them. Uh, much to their chagrin sometimes. Um, what if we did that at the federal level? Would it not then require uh, more attention to the long term? Would it also not seem more fair in a certain sense? You know, voters born today are certainly shortchanged in the current process. Um, you know, they're not actually voting today. They're not paying taxes today. But they're going to be voting and paying taxes in 25 years. And many of the decisions being made today are going to foreclose options for them in 25 years if certain things happen that they can no longer then take back. So decisions by this Congress today affect future taxpayers. Shouldn't, in a certain sense, they be represented in the constitutional work? That's the basic idea of the balanced budget amendment. And I kind of sympathize with that. Um, but there's some major, major cons, unfortunately. I think cons that are, are of such magnitude that I would unbalance be against the idea. Um, the first one being it's almost impossible to imagine it working very well. That is to say, you have to write in some words into the Constitution that are then have to be interpreted by a, the judicial branch, because you can't write out the judicial branch out of this. Very difficult to do. People try to in various versions of the amendment, but you know, if there's a dispute about what the words mean, it will it'll end up in the Supreme Court. And so you have to write in the Constitution um, something like, you know, revenues can't exceed, or spending can't exceed revenues, and if that were to occur, you know, certain things have to be cut uh, to make sure it doesn't. Well, you know, as soon as you do something like that, disputes, what, what if the Congress doesn't actually fix the problem? And you actually end up in a situation where you're in breach. The courts would have to come in, probably the government would get sued by a taxpayer, and the courts would have to come in and rectify the situation. So you have the courts getting involved directly in matters that are heretofore not the judicial branch's purview. Spending by the federal government, getting involved in programs, getting involved in you know, what's an appropriate uh, definition of the revenue base, and so on. So when I've looked at this, uh, that has always struck me as being a big, big problem. It's also very likely to be too inflexible. It's true that we've got this massive incentive toward robbing from the future, you know, because of short-term itis. But sometimes, you know, it's okay to run a small deficit or even a big deficit. Um, you just can't do it forever and permanently. And so, when you had the financial crisis hit in 2009, uh, in 2008, and then in continuing into 2009, we were going to run big deficits no matter who was in charge. If the Republicans had been in charge, they would have run huge deficits too. President Bush was going to run a huge deficit. Um, there was no way around it. It was going to happen. If you have a balanced budget amendment, it means you have to write in exceptions for that kind of thing to happen, at which point you're already in the middle of complicated constitutional language. How do you write an exception? So. Uh, I think it, it suffers from, unfortunately, from being perhaps uh, too cumbersome to actually work. One of the reasons why it actually it hasn't happened yet. Uh, now, I've gone over my, my time, so I'm going to hurry up and get to, to uh, 
my bottom line, which will be totally unsatisfying. Um, <laughs> ben Franklin said, um, so, you know, Jack says he's coming out of the Council Convention, and they put the whole thing together and said, well, are you done? He said, yeah, we're done. You know, what, what, what did we get? He said, well, you got a republic if you can keep it, right? And, you know, nobody knows exactly what he meant by that, but I think he, you know, more or less had the sentiment of most of the founders of the country, which is there was a little bit of skepticism, dating all the way back to those ancient Greeks, about whether democratic self-governance could actually work. I think we really were the first country founded on basically just this idea and that idea alone, nothing else, you know? And he was reflecting the sentiment of, well, here we go, let's see if we can make a go of it. And it's worked out pretty well. However, um, one of the reasons why it, uh, We've done so well, is it was built on uh, a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of um, ways of thinking and virtue, maybe you put it that way, that uh, served as well. There's certainly a a um, puritanical <laughs> side to American life that fed into American governance for a pretty long time. You didn't spend what you didn't have, and Moreover, it was very important to leave to your children and generations to come a country that would be better than the way you found it and the way you inherited it. And uh, there was a sense of self-sacrifice toward that goal. And I think we are losing that a little bit. Maybe, maybe I should think that's an understatement. And so I think our challenge essentially is, I went to a conference about it nine months ago at a college, not unlike this one, not too far away in Georgia, and the, the title of the conference was Stuck with Virtue, where they grappled with these kind of questions and other questions. And essentially the bottom line of it was that there's no substitute for self-sacrifice, civic-mindedness, um, engaged active citizens doing the right thing. Uh, voting for people that are responsible, you know, not dismissing people when they provide difficult and reasoned arguments about complicated problems, not reducing everything to silly slogans and sound bites, and uh, you know the story. Um, and so we need to do our best to try to capture that. I don't, I'm not, I'm not naive at all about about our current political culture, but I do think that there's still room in this country for uh, responsible citizenship to put in place good people, and I do see that. I mean, let's not let's not be uh, dismissive of all of our politicians. There are very civic-minded people who are elected, who do a lot of self-sacrifice and are willing to do the right thing. Um, they just need a few more uh, people willing them to help them get over the finish line. And then, of course, you know, now I've you know, used every cliche in the book, I'll use one more. Um, so Winston Churchill, you know, everybody says, you know, he attributes to him, he may not have actually said it, but we all like to think he did, uh, that Americans always do the right thing, having exhausted every other alternative. <laughs> and I, I think we're about to exhaust pretty much, you know, every all, other alternative. <laughs> And so we're on the cusp of doing the right thing. I'm confident of it. I don't know when, um, but you know we will. Um, and uh, maybe I'll stop. Thank you. <laughs>
I would say that uh, I, I, you know, I have to confess I'm not for that idea. I think it would be uh, such a shock to our political culture to have uh, appointed senators um, that are accountable maybe to a political system that has a level of trust maybe even below um, the, uh, uh, the trust we might have in our fellow uh, voting uh, citizens. Uh, so, you know, there is a certain level of accountability. I think American government at the moment is, is uh, really accountable. I think the internet age is making everybody instantaneously accountable for everything, for good or ill some ways, you know. But uh, your idea might, might, be, might, in a certain sense, be viewed as allowing people a little more room to maneuver, because they don't have to answer to the public. But on the other hand, uh, I think our, our culture really values that level of citizen accountability. And I think I do too, more so than, than going back to the sort of backroom uh, negotiations and you know how they would get appointed. You can imagine the uh, potential for corruption in that kind of a system. And I think that's probably the last thing we need is more distrust of uh, people in power. And I think I would agree that. Sir. Just one example of when Lincoln and Douglas had their debates, everybody knew that the winner would be whichever party controlled the Illinois legislature, didn't it? So I mean it wasn't back room particularly. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. In that, that particular case. Yeah, that's true. I mean they had the French debates, but the legislature was the one who was actually, yeah. yeah. That's quite that's a very good point. But it's much more <laughs> uh, Potentially, you know, that's how it worked in that instance, but it doesn't have to work that way, you know, and uh, there could be, a, you know, all kinds of reasons why someone got appointed and someone else did it, of which I breed mistrust and disillusionment. Might strengthen political parties. Might. Might. I'll, I'll leave it open to the political scientists to, uh, I don't see a lot of opinions in the newspapers saying, uh, hey, let's go back to uh, uh, appointed senators. I'm not sure. I'm not holding my breath that that's about to happen. Let me put it that way. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I was just, I was just, you know, you're talking about the various figures about the uh, the debt and so. I mean, one of the I have not here on the radio, uh, one of the talk show, it's talking about the debt. Uh, like 1969 was less than 300 billion dollars. Then they said, you know, today is like six trillion dollars, which struck me as a I mean, that, that really was a, a real aisle for me. I mean, you're talking about like 53 years. We're talking about $269 billion in 1969, and then it's $6 trillion now. I mean, somebody's not watching something. I mean, this is Congress pays this much debt in 53 years. I mean, uh, and then we're talking about, uh, there's, Statistically, they're like saying that now people are, um, I believe you could say something about like 48% of the people, uh, people eligible to pay in, uh, federal income tax that uh, do not pay federal income tax, or which 52% of people uh, pay federal income tax, like, uh, I don't know, it's two or three years ago, what, whenever the statistics. Yeah. And, uh, and then also you talk about the uh, cultural of the, uh, Doing, doing what's right, and the, uh, uh, the self, uh, you know, self-sacrifice, and doing uh, what you feel about, uh, how you feel about, you're leaving something better for your children, and, and so on like this. Whereas I, that culture is, is it, it's it depends on where you're at in the United States, and uh, what, uh, what, what kind of people you're around. I mean, like uh, the army. The army today is has a, many many of the people that are in the army has that type of uh, I mean, uh, attitude. But uh, I have found that that is not that is not the cultural of of the uh, a lot of the uh, uh, everyday citizens. I mean, this is it's more of a uh, 
look it out for yourself and uh, like I say 47 percent or 48 percent or whatever are not paying federal income tax. I mean how can you sustain a country as large as the United States uh, in, in the sense that they are making their money, they are not making enough money to pay federal income tax or they are on programs such that they uh, do not qualify to pay federal income tax. I'm not sure what the what the the statistics are where that that applies to, but in other words, they're either not making enough money to pay federal income tax, or they're on programs to such that they are not uh, yeah. eligible to pay federal income yeah, tax. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, look, uh, as one of your your comments, um, I uh, just let's talk about the tax part for for, for instance. I think. Um, one thing that's happened at the at the federal level is that the impulse, you know, you might think from our political debates that the impulse in, in federal legislating and policy making has been to really stick it to the middle class and the working line. Now that's basically what you hear from politicians. I'm here for the middle class because he's he's gotten the short end. Well, that's last, a lie. That's a lie. Yeah, well, let me just finish. Okay. For the last 50 years, he's gotten the short end. And you know the work, you know the lower middle class guy has gotten the, the short end over the last 50 years. The actual history of what's gone on in federal legislating and policy for the last half century is exactly the opposite. The impulse has been, you know, people coming to Congress, activists saying, "I want to do something to help those people. I want to do more." And so they passed many, many amendments to the tax law and to the federal spending side of the budget to try to give more benefits and take them off the tax rolls. So there's been this impulse to actually not to, you know, they make it, they make it seem as if the Congress is sitting around all day, hey, let's give out some big things to the rich. That's not, that's just not, that's a really distorted view of what goes on in Congress. What's been going on in Congress for a long time, half a century, is to create new benefit programs and take middle and lower middle class people off the tax rolls. And that's what your comments reflect. That's not necessarily a bad thing. I'm not saying it's, but the idea that this is that we've got this situation we're in because we are we've been un you know we've been sort of secretly sticking it to the little guy is really not true. What's happened to the middle class and lower middle class is globalization. That's really what's happened to the lower middle class. We've had the global economy displace lots of lower wage jobs through foreign trade. That's what's happened. So we've been more pressure on the private economy for the middle class and lower middle class, but not from the government. The government has tried every which way they can to give them more benefits and take them off the tax rolls. And so we've got a very confused political debate, in part because of misperception about that. Yeah, I wonder if you'd comment on the more on the, on the revenue side of the, of, of the deficit and tax expenditures, and we all think home ownership's a great, a great thing you know, may not need it for two months, though, right, right? Right, you don't need it for two months. Also, some of the some of the industrial subsidies, perhaps the oil industry and some, and some other areas, are very healthy industries, are continuing to receive historic, uh, uh, significant uh, tax credit. Uh, I'm for closing about every possible thing you can imagine. I mean, I think in terms of uh, better policy for the long term, we need to clean up our federal tax law substantially. Um, and that would mainly mean getting rid of and limiting the big tax expenditures, which are candidly going to a lot of upper middle class people. Um, things like charitable deduction, I'm for it, you know, but it doesn't necessarily have to be for every possible um, uh, thing that people might be able to use as a tax shelter. Um, the right now when employers buy health insurance for everybody, that's totally untaxed, and so it encourages very expansive health benefits at the employer level. Um, the home ownership uh, thing. I mean, I think you could probably limit it to homes below, you know, some reasonable amount, five hundred thousand dollars or something. Um, and people that can afford two million dollars homes would still buy them. I'm not sure I'd worry too much about that. Um, and uh, anyway, so there's a number of things that can be done, including, I don't know that much about the energy issues. Uh, I'm not sure I can comment on that. 
but I, I take your point. What about the extravagant rise in the cost of health care? That is, that is when Steve and Dan are going to ask me to come down and give another lecture <laughs> to fix the healthcare system. And that will be a three and a four hour lecture, and you're welcome to come. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, fixing the healthcare system in terms of this cost pressures is a hugely complicated subject. There are two choices the country can make. We can either go down the road, which we are going down now with the new law, where the government is involved in resource allocation in the health system mostly like the way they do it in Canada and, and most of Europe. Where the government tries to limit the expenditures through decisions regulatory-wise to how, how resources can allocate. The alternative to that is to have a much more functioning marketplace for the health system than we do today. And I'm in favor of the market-based approach, but I'm currently on the losing side of that argument. Um, that's the short answer. One more back there. probably never will happen, but it seems if I heard you correctly and I understand the situation like I think I do, a majority of the problems are coming from perhaps the unreasonable amount of power that our legislative branch has, especially when it comes to controlling the purse strings and you know it's this kind of economic climate. Um, hypothetically, again, I doubt we'll ever yeah. see this amendment, but do you think we would be better off with a less powerful legislative branch like we see in Parliament, for example? That's really interesting. This is a very good question. It's <laughs> 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 a very, very, very good question. Quite the box. Now, it, it, it requires, I know we're past our time, it requires a little bit of an extended answer. Look, if you look around the world, countries that are, you know, the whole entire Western world is in some sense grappling with the same problems we are, some more severe. I was mentioning at lunch today that some countries have already taken more steps than we have because their problems predated ours. But um, if you look at what Italy did and Greece did in, the, in response to their crisis, was very gets very little public commentary, but it's absolutely astounding what they did. They essentially installed prime ministers who were elected by nobody. Now, Greece subsequently had another election, but for a period of time they had essentially two technocrats installed more or less with the blessing of the EU to try to handle fiscal matters. And that's still the case in Italy. Nobody elected Mario Monti to be prime minister. He's been running the country now for the last six months with no mandate whatsoever from the voters. It's very amazing what happens when people get into a crisis. And what happened in the United States last year, right? They created this thing called the Super Committee. It didn't work, but they essentially delegated huge, unprecedented legislative powers, this is a great political science issue, uh, to the 12 apostles, right? They have a 12 person <laughs> committee. We're supposed to you know, fix everything for everybody. And they couldn't agree, but uh, they had massive legislative authority delegated to them by Congress. Congress has also created in the healthcare sphere something called the Independent Payment Advisory Board, which is essentially in charge now, if it doesn't get repealed, it's very unpopular, but it's a 15 member appointed board by the president, and they are allowed to control Medicare spending going forward uh, without any reference back to Congress. Um, so your idea is already taken hold. Now, there's a lot of people who don't like it, be included, right? Because there's certain lack of accountability when you do that. I mean, I much prefer for our Congress to act responsibly than to have, you know, these powers being delegated to you know, authorities who, who knows who these people are and who they're accountable to. So, um, interesting times, I would say, and, you know, very thought-provoking question. Yeah, Jim, I'm wondering if you could just end with, with this. This has been great, but it's been really abstract. I, I can't wrap my head around trillions yeah. and billions. Today, you shared a story about what it's like cutting budgets and, uh, and sometimes engaging in spending increases when you, were, when you were the government and you could do these things. Could you just tell that story about Sure. Started, uh, budget cut of the uh, Lobo Library. Sure, sure, sure. So, 
I, when I, I started working at the Office of Management and Budget again, my second time through in 2001, where I worked for President Bush, and I, I was a political appointee, and I had responsibility for a lot of portions of the budget. And um, I, unbeknownst to me, when I took the job, I also had responsibility for the National Endowment for the Arts, which I knew nothing about, still don't know much about, and didn't spend any time on. Um, but it was a very small program. And I need to actually pre proceed this by telling you that when I first got the job, I also had responsibility for a little library commission. Um, and amongst other things, I had to sort of watch over. And my staff gave me the very bad advice. I never liked, I never blamed them always for this. Uh, throw them under the bus. They said, hey, get rid of this library commission. It doesn't do anything. It's worthless. It's just a little commission that's sort of feeding off the taxpayers. So in my first budget round, I proposed getting rid of it. And I think it did get, eventually did get axed. Um, but when that happened, uh, some newspaper, you know, they, they, the little people who worked at the commission leaked the story to a newspaper in Texas. So a, a newspaper story appeared in Texas, Bush budget mixes library funding despite First Lady's love of libraries. <laughs> okay. And it sort of made, you know, President Bush cold-hearted dagger through these poor little, low, you know, librarians, you know, sticking the, you know, knife in kind of thing. So the, the witch hunt then ensued in the White House to figure out what goofball, who did this? <laughs> and of course the finger eventually came back to, you know, me. So they said, okay, Capretta, you know, fool is one. So I got, you know, I was sensitized, you know, if it's a first lady priority, it's my priority too. <laughs> so a couple of years later, the guy from the NEA comes into my office and he says, I got a great idea for you. I've been working on this thing with the first lady. My ears perk up. I say, okay, sounds like a good idea. He says, I'm gonna, I want to increase the NEA budget, NEA budget by, I think it was $30 million. And the base budget was about $150 million, which I never paid any attention to, as I said. Uh, and he was going to do two things. He was going to take art to military bases, like a, a roving, you know, wandering art show that went to military bases. And then he wanted to take Shakespeare off the, uh, as I joked this morning, you know, red state Shakespeare. It was like sort of take Shakespeare out of the blue states and give it to the red states, you know? So instead of having all the Shakespeare funding just in LA and San Francisco and uh, New York, you know, they're going to do. Shakespearean plays in Kansas and you know whatever you know all the hinterland okay so maybe maybe Tennessee uh, so uh, I say sounds great to me the first lady's for it I'm for it you know I salute and I tell my staff put it in the budget you know I don't even want to think about it I clear it with my boss I say put it in the budget so it goes in the budget I forget all about it two months later uh, in January of 2004. And the, the uh, new Congress is convening, and the President Bush has a meeting with the House Republicans where they get together at the beginning of the year to do a rah rah session about all the great things they're going to do that year. He's going to give them a pep talk. And he's flying up to their meeting in Philadelphia on an helicopter, Marine One. And that morning I wake up, and the Washington Post has a story saying uh, somebody leaked to the Washington Post surprise, surprise. NEA budget under Bush to go up by 20%. I said, well, that's a funny way to put it. <laughs> so 30 million on 150 million, sure enough, it's a 20% increase. So this headline is sitting there, all the House Republicans, I'm going to describe them to you, they're all my friends, but you know, they have certain views on things. They see this headline, they say, what in the world is going on at the White House? Why is President Bush increasing the NEA budget 20%? So there's all this hue and cry going on. So they, I get up and, and my Blackberry's sort of dancing on the counter because there's so many phone calls coming in. What is this all about? I get a call from the guy who's flying with the president out to the meeting. And he says, Jim, you know, we understand you're the one who did this. What could you possibly have been thinking, you know? And I said, well, look, I, I was told it was a first lady priority. <laughs> so then the guy on the phone, you know, He's sitting there with the president, you know, he got, blah, 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 you know, talks to him and says, okay, we're all good, you know? <laughs> hang on the phone, I was like, okay, I dodged that bullet, you know? I got hit by some other ones, but that, that one I dodged. Anyway, thank you very much. Yeah.